So welcome to uh, the writer panel for uh, the Galaxy's Greatest Online Convention. I'm joined by three of our top writers at 2000 AD. Um, uh, for this panel, we, 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 we're talking to our panelists uh, because they're writers who are, are in their own ways pushing the boundaries of uh, what 2000 AD is and what 2000 AD can do. And they're pushing in different ways, whether it's digging down into characters we thought we knew all along or reaching uh, new audiences. So uh, over the next hour, we're going to be talking about how 2080 is, is changing, how 2080 stories happen uh, and how uh, what it means to be a 2080 story, a 2080 AD creator. Uh, is changing in the 21st century and it is an absolute pleasure to welcome our three guests uh, starting off with Rob Williams. Hello. Uh, Alex DeCampi. Hello. And Alish Cott. Oh, hello everybody. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, like I said I, I want to talk a, a little bit about uh, the craft of storytelling for 2000 AD uh, and, and, and how each of you have your own approaches and your own directions. Uh, Rob, you're, you're, you're the veteran uh, 2000 AD droid of this, uh, of this bunch. Don't look all offended. It's because I'm bald. Um, but you, you've, you've, you've been with us uh, 15 years now? Yeah, longer, actually. I was talking... Um... PJ Holden actually was saying the other day that I think my first dread was 15 years ago, which is terrifying enough. Mm. So uh, tell us a, a little bit about uh, how you approach writing for 2000 AD, because your uh, your stories, things like um, Joe, Stred Joe Stred Titan, um, the Hershey story that, uh, that, that you're continuing with Simon Fraser, these uh, strike me very much as uh, exploring characters that we think we know. Um, but exploring them in a way that's 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 quite visceral, quite psychological. Um, what's your what's your approach to telling these stories uh, as as a comic book writer? Um, I mean, I guess it's not bloody minded. It's it's just sort of you sort of go in and you just I just tell the stories I'm interested in telling, which is very simplistic, and and I'm not a, a remotely thinking for good or ill um, what you know, or what would the, the, the regular 2080 or the hardcore 2080 readers necessarily respond to? I think there's a freedom in that. And there's also, that can put you at odds at certain times with, with, with things that have gone before. But I think it's, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't come in sort of going, oh, I'm going to write a 2080 story. I mean, the only thing I would say I do is by the nature of it being 2080 and it's, we tell in six page chapters you know i mean structurally that that affects it um and, and really i've said before we're like we're six you know it's, we're going into structure a bit early which i didn't expect but um six pages is great you've got you've got very little time to do anything other than three act structure i find i mean you can sort of you know um you can you can push that a, a, a little but effectively you've got two pages of setup two pages of middle act and the character wanting something and trying to get it and then a twist and a cliffhanger and you're out and I always feel like it's it's a little bit writing for you know the Republic serials or something you know the, the, those type of shorts where you've got to end on a big cliffhanger so the rules are there and as a result it kind of stops me disappearing up my own backside too much although I can occasionally do that as well um but no, it's it's just. I mean, but but you know, I mean, I guess I, I mix all that in what I've said with the fact that I, you know, I, I, I'm a long time reader and I loved reading it when I was twelve and thirteen, and I loved mm. Dread and I loved Dread's World, and um, so that you know that you know I, I've got enough knowledge, but then, um, but really, you're coming in and just bottom line is telling stories that you you find interesting. Yeah, I mean that that's an interesting point about having that knowledge base. Uh, to be able to to to, to do that, because I, I, Alex, you, you you've you've spoken before about um, you know finding great big stacks of uh, of two thousand AD and, and and absolutely devouring them. Do you find that that have, having that the memory of how two thousand AD stories are structured really helps when you're doing your own stories, or is it something that's just kind of background radiation? Um, I'm not sure how much. I mean, I, you know, having read so much of 2000 AD from about kind of age 25 onwards. I came to it a bit late due to geographic issues. 
um, uh, you know, having having a really strong idea of of what a 2000 AD story looked like was really helpful when when I started talking to Tharg about things. Um, and Tharg, of course, knew that I'd, I'd, I'd mainlined a ton of 2000 AD. So, you know, uh, but I was never one for writing. I, I'm very bad at writing other people's characters. Um, well, I mean, I, you know, quality wise, I'll leave the readers to who for, for whom I've done a little work for hire to judge. But um, it, it's never been something I've, I've been able to, like, really rally my um, uh rally my 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 intellect around and my creativity so I, I you know I have so much respect for folks like Rob who take an old thing and make it new on a regular basis um I can only take a new thing and make it weird and uncomfortable on a regular basis um I, I've really grown grown to love the five to six page I mean some of us are in the prog and only have five pages Rob come on um uh, the five to six page uh installment length though because it's a I, I'm not I don't stick as hard to Three act structure as Rob does. Um, I'm much more instinctual with my writing. It's kind of like a, a musical thing. Like I, you know, there's a there's a sense of pacing that happens, um, and I don't deliberately think of it as set up, you know, uh, middle act resolution and cliffhanger. It's just it's just kind of, I just kind of wing it. Um, but what I really love about uh, doing something in five pages is creating the illusion of space in it because it's no space at all. But also, you know, if you can if you can get a double page spread in there or something that just makes you feel like you've got this very compressed little story and then there's it, it makes it even more impactful when you've got this huge moment in it. Um, and the story I'm working, you know, the series I'm working on right now, uh, Full Tilt Boogie has this wonderful Spanish artist, Ed Ocaña there uh, drawing it, who's got very, very intricate um, uh, line work, Lean Claire and, 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 you know, I'd be a fool if I wasn't giving him the space to draw like a giant battleship being constructed in an orbital shipyard. You know, it would just be it would just be painful and and um, not to not to indulge in that. But yeah, I, I love the I love the 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 taking a tiny amount of space and making it seem almost cathedral like uh, that you can do when you're when you're really hitting it right on those five to six page uh, stories. Of course. Uh, uh... Alish, you have a, a bit more space to to, to play with because uh, the Devil in War series that, that you've been writing um, has, on average, ten pages uh, in the uh, in the Joyce Dread magazine. Does 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 that make yeah, right. all okay. the difference? <laughs> um, I mean, it makes a diff it makes a huge difference. I mean, I think I learned how to write sort of. I wanted to understand if I could write comics years and years ago. The two things I did is I wrote like a um, six or 12 pager, I forget which. And then I wrote like a graph, 150 page graphic novel script just to see if I actually, you know, had the work ethic. And I think it taught me that there's no one proper system unless you're one of those people who function best underneath one system. For me, it's very much a case of Nobody at 2000 AD ever basically told me, look, you can't really do that because this nobody's going to get it or because the structure is too weird or because you're going to go too maximalist or too minimalist about something, which is really pleasant because they that means that, you know, I'm trusted to actually do my job properly, which is the job I've chosen, which is to be away from people and send them pages and turn them into money. Um, <laughs> but also to make really interesting, fun stuff with that. And I, so kind of like the thing I go with is, you know, once I, once I run everything just like outline wise by, you know, the select space committees and all that, um, is I just kind of trust my instinct as to which way I want to go. And sometimes that will lend itself to going Okay, let's let's really dial it in and go like three act or five act structure on these twelve pages because I need to convey a certain amount of things and information and all that stuff. And other times I'll be just like, I just want a musical with a talking dildo right now, and that's what I'm gonna do because nobody can stop me, and nobody stopped me, so that's pretty cool. Um, 
And, you know, sometimes you make the talking dildo musical uh, fit into a traditional structure after all. And that's beautiful. And everybody's happy then. Both parts of my brain feel like they're doing something. Um, and then comes the sense of, I guess, you know, having more pages. I mean, every page that you have is just an incredible amount of real estate, you know, whether like... <laughs> You can do anything. You can do any. Like I, I know that I'm just you know quoting the absolute classics here when it comes to like uh, who was it? Was it Eisner who said that you can do anything with words and pictures, or was that Kirby? It was somebody a long time ago. I think it was Jack Kirby. I'm fairly sure. Um, but also, I heard that quote get mis gets misattributed a lot. Um, either way, I don't know. I just look at the page and kind of go. 12 of those pages means that you can give people their worth and ideally you could get you get them to come back to those pages and look again and go wait like was that really a uh, dancing singing dildo in a top hat and how is this possible and why does the first and last panel mirror each other is there a deeper message in it there's not but i want them to feel like maybe there is so you know it's fun it's great i'm very lucky 12 pages or 10 pages whichever it is, I forget, um, is generally pretty great and a lot, especially in 2008. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's probably worth pointing out uh, those who are watching this panel who, who haven't read the Judge Dredd magazine, specifically the Devil in War series, is that Alice is not kidding. There is a talking, singing, dancing. It's uh, great. Okay. <laughs> it's great. And you need to be accurate. Yeah. Scientifically speaking. It's it's and it's you know it's it's uh, it's something of a Rorschach test uh, for 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 people who are uh, reading it. Um, That's one thing. I mean, with two thousand one interesting thing I find about two thousand eight, apart from the regen stuff, no one has ever in all the years I've worked for it has ever gone. We're this rated, you know. It's really <laughs> kind of up to the individual creator's voice of like this story is. I I want this story to be this and. I think that's kind of freeing. I mean, I think it says something about we should we should give a little nod to Matt Smith, who allows us the freedom yeah. to, you know, you really don't get with 2000 e that heavy. Yeah. You do with other publishers, you know, an editorial kind of, you know, coming in and going, no, this this doesn't suit this audience. There is a sense that if you if you dig it and you're into it, uh, you know, you get the total freedom to do in, in its own little way. It's a, it's like little little creator owned even though we don't own it but um but in in in, in sort of intent going in put it that way i mean i remember the fight i had with an american publisher to get two characters which are specifically like out of continuity um alternate universe character same sex characters to be able to have one tiny smooch um and ultimately you had you know they couldn't kiss on the lips one had to kiss the other one on the forehead and it was like guys you know in in the year of our lord 2020 we're gonna do this like <laughs> we're having this discussion um, and, uh, you know, I think 2080 is much more supportive of, it, it encourages, you know, via the fact that they've hired people like Alice and me to just, you know, do, I won't say balls to the wall, genitals to the wall, we'll keep this, you know, uh, general, um, you know, whatever, whatever you want to, and, to, and, and to be in, to feel like you have an environment where you can, experiment and push yourself as hard as you can is, is, is incredibly valuable to me because my entire work ethos is essentially one of, of play of like trying to make myself happy and trying to push my skills further. Um, and, and, and just, you know, every comic is, is a laboratory in a way uh, to try to do something new. And sometimes it fails, sometimes it works. And, you know, there are very few publishers, um, who lets you do that unless it's a completely creator own thing that you're paying for yourself, which is why most of mine is my other work is completely creator owned that I pay for myself. <laughs> but you one know, thing I think it's an interesting difference between at least Rob and I, because we've discussed this before is Rob writes week to week and I will write an entire arc in one document, mm. but then I do, you know, I do less, I do fewer stories than he does. Um, but I let, you know, I'm, I always find that if I try to go week to week, I'll hit episode eight, and there's something I really want to tweak in episode two. Yeah, no, I, that is true. But I mean, I, I I do plan. I've got it all 
yeah. largely planned out. I just give myself a lot of room to dance in between the, okay. kind of, the, the you know. No, I'm not suggesting you completely, you know, are we? Yeah, as I go along. But you know, the, the, you, all you, we, all, we all know how 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 much sway there is between even a fairly thorough outline, and then when you start doing breakdowns. Yeah, sure. With with, with this with this freedom, it, it you know, like I said at the top, Alish uh, is is writing a fairly mature um, uh, series, uh, whereas Alex, you are. Uh, you're writing an all age series for, for the 2080 region, which is the, 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 the um, all ages specials that we do four times a year. Um, going into that, uh, what were your expectations of how that would, would, how that process would take place, how that process would, would turn out? Because uh, you know, it, it, there, there's there's lots of discussion about what it means to be all ages, whether it means just for kids, you know things like that, but you know you, you've you've been quite clear that that with something like Full Tilt Boogie, you it's not it's not something that you necessarily want to be safe, but something that can do interesting things within the framework of all ages. I was Full Tilt Boogie takes a lot of its inspiration from uh, classic anime, um, specifically, you know, the ones I grew up on, which were Gacha Man and um, Space Battle Cruiser Yamato, or as their bad US network dubs were known, um, Star Blazers and Battle of the Planets. And I've always loved the kind of, the fact that an anime like that is considered all ages, like um, Star Blazers, um, can still also have really like impactful emotional arcs and emotional storylines um, about you, you, you know, the usual anime stuff about friendship, about family relationships, about found family, you know, the classic anime, you know, the, 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 the real, the real, the real victory was the friends we made along the way. Um, and I wanted to bring that series. And I, I felt 2080 was a good place for that because um, it, I, I could have enough emotional sophistication um, and suspense, which I'm, you know, quite good at, um, that it would keep the older readers interested in it and not going, oh, this is just a kitty thing. Um, they'll be like, oh, this is a kid's thing, but I'm going to read it anyway, you know, um, uh, while having a sense of wonder and the stories of friendship that I think, you know, appeal to younger readers. I mean, it's fundamentally about a girl bounty hunter who has her own spaceship and you know if you like if you like having your own spaceship was quite high on my list of priorities when I was a child um I haven't managed it yet but um you know <laughs> there's still time there's still time yeah mug Jeff Bezos or something speaking about flying dildos um uh, <laughs> uh so yeah again it's it, it's the complexity of the line that I'm walking that excites me. Um, you know, if it were just like, oh, do something that's just for kids, you know, I've again, I've done that, but it always ends up getting a bit heavier than it should. Um, uh, and uh, more, you know, more emotionally um, impactful than, than, than necessarily other writers go for. Um, you know, as a kid, I grew up on, um, you know, Eastern European, mainly Romanian fairy tales and Greek myths, and neither of those are have a light touch in terms of you know where they're willing to go like bad things happen um and i think it's important to have bad things happen in stories for kids because it helps it helps them you know as, as all sorts of psychology about children's tales has no doubt has been has said um it helps them understand in their own lives the spectrum of what is a bad thing and what is a thing that is you know just a minor inconvenience um so you know i, I haven't been afraid to let let bad things happen to my characters and it's been fun to like the second arc, which Ed is drawing right now. And there's a huge delay basically because his, his, his and my schedules are both insane. <laughs> and um, so by the time I got around to writing uh, episode, the second arc, uh, Ed was busy on a French book until just, just Christmas. Um, and then, uh, so that's, that's, we, we are very committed to it. It's just that the last couple of years my schedule has been insane. And so I'm, I'm not, I'm not sad about that. Them's high class problems, but Yeah. Um, but the second arc is I start to sort of tease through, I start to show you some of the things I hinted at in the first arc. And it is, there's some actually quite nightmare fuely disturbing stuff in there, but it's all PG. 
And again, that's a very fun line to walk. I don't get gore. I don't get swears. I don't get, you know, in shooting guns at people. I have to think of ways that people can be dispatched in ways that don't involve bloodiness. Um, but that, that still leaves me a lot of like very creepy stuff to do. Alish, I, I wanted to ask you kind of the, the, the flip side of this question, which is that you're working with a, a, a character, Devil in War, uh, created by uh, John Smith and Sean Phillips, who is is known for being risque, uh, for 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 you know for for being a, uh, a, a it's, it's almost reductive to call him uh, gay. He's, he's kind of you know Flam flaming homosexual. A flaming homosexual. There we go. Uh, uh, you know, and he's a he's a former Vatican exorcist and a vampire and all these other things. But you're working within the, the, the bodybuilder. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're all working within the boundaries of this wider mythos that John Smith uh, and Sean Phillips created. Um, I wanted to ask you about the 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 the, the amount of uh, boundary pushing that you felt you could do with that character. Whether you were like, well, this is well, this is like a playground for me, or whether you thought, well, you know. There are there are pressure points here that I can push. There are directions that I can go in. <laughs> That's something you would say, wouldn't he? Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, so, yeah. Sorry, sorry for interrupting. I think I got the gist of your question, but yeah, well, it's, it's, it's it's just um, with with the uh, with a character that already exists, mm -hmm. um, how you approached pushing it in a, not necessarily in a new direction, but pushing it a bit further than it necessarily gone before. Well, the first thing you have to do is just buy a big bucket of lube. Um, and uh, <laughs> you know, um, basically, I just, I don't know, I was, I feel like this all started with a tweet, right? Like, I feel like I tweeted at 2000 AD, quite possibly when you were managing the 2000 AD Twitter, or maybe over Facebook. I don't know what it was, but I was like, I would write to Devil and Bo, and then the next thing I know it was. Um, but I just remember sort of being like, okay, I'm just going to run the, you know, the most fun story that comes to my brain by, by Matt and, and see what happens. And either he says, well, we're going too far here or it will be the opposite, right? And my thinking was always just like, you know, I'll just do one for myself here and have fun and feel like I wrote something for 2000 AD, which was important for me uh, early on. And... I just kind of, you know, wrote a 12-pager, I think, about, uh, you know, Devlin coming into his housing estate and finding a real demon that, you know, existed or existed, who knows. Um, it was a demon of grammar errors that the monks blamed for everything since like the 14th century. And then I realized, oh, you know, it's, it's going to be just like trying to find some way to exist now. And... Then I realized that, of course, Devlin's coming from an orgy, which I don't think was a part of the original pitch, but I was just like, why is he wearing nothing but, you know, Balenciaga raincoat? And why is there a dildo in his pocket? You know, we, we, we mentioned, and I don't think that 2000 AD is just about the, you know, the, the contrast to, to the American comics, not at all. Um, but I think it's kind of funny to think about it sometimes because I'm like, you know, I'm pretty sure that like some people who like, you know, um, some people in the U.S. look at Iron Man and go, oh, you know, maybe one day Iron Man will cure cancer. And, um, you know, I look at 2000 AD and I go, well, Devlin's, you know, hoping that the fisting party is still on and Dread is going to try to shoot cancer in the neck. And that's about it. And that feels much more realistic and relieving and demented in ways that I actually find are closer to the real world and further away from its sort of unexpressed pathologies. And I like that 2000 AD fully leans into the expressed pathology part of the human spectrum. So with Devlin, it was very much like the combo of, these are all the fun things and all the things that are just like, you know, you rarely get a chance to write a, an unapologetically queer, non-original character in in comics industry because there's still you know plenty to do on that front frankly um but to then top that off with this demented layer of the weirdest you know demonic slash just demented slash whatever third word 
starting with the is that's I don't know it's just joy it's very um it has the feeling of a pressure you know of a pressure valve just getting slightly loosened and like sort of like reminding myself why making comics in the first place is still a fun thing um so yeah never really felt like I had to push much at all Thank brilliant you. brilliant well, uh, Rob I, I want to come to you next because um with uh, the stuff you, you, you've been doing with Dread and, and, and with Hershey in particular, there's, uh, I, I, I've, I've felt there's a degree of uh, fun having, even if it's not fun for the characters themselves with being put through the ringer, but it does feel sometimes that, that you are having fun with established characters and, you know, exploring them in the way that you want to explore them. I hope so. I mean, the thing is, it's one of the yeah. I mean, I think maybe the last dread I did, I forget, was was you dread the musical, which was mm. utterly ridiculous. And 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 then you have the contrast of you've got this incredible artwork by Chris Weston. You've got probably the silliest script I've ever written. Is that already out? It came out just before Christmas. Um, I need to read that. Okay, thank you. It's just so basically it's like sensitive Clegg does a musical about a rapping, a sort of Hamilton rapping musical about dread's life basically um and it's and he's a giant talking crocodile who decides he's the only person who can has the empathy necessary to, to portray dread on stage so he he raps dread's life story it's not the most serious piece in the world but i mean one of the nice things about that is like like say if you then like say the hershey stuff um is is, is very sort of trying to kind of dig down into feelings of like here's someone whose life path is over you know who, who basically has, has, has run their race and 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 the, you know the whole thing she you know she went up the the sort of the pyramid of being a great judge being the chief judge and then her times they don't last long so then her time's over so what what do you do then and and to to tell a story of an older woman protagonist who is dealing with those kind of issues. It's that's not the most. It's not the most fun story in the world by the nature, because essentially it's someone having a kind of existential breakdown, frankly, and and doing it in in Dread's world with with a backdrop of vengeance. But it's much more interested in in trying to give her some agency as as as, as a character, and hopefully, and and you know, it's not. It's she's not in a remotely happy place. She's dealing with, with a lot of things, but I mean, but then I put Dirty Frank with her along the way, and there's a little lightness there. But there's always huge amounts of pathos with Dirty Frank as well. So, but but I mean, again, Two Thousand is an anthology, right? I mean, that's one of the great things about it is you you can have a very serious, more noirish piece like that, um, and it'll be back to back with something silly and heightened that really sort of is. And, and and that's fine, you know. And you and again, we have the art styles. You have Simon Fraser doing absolutely beautiful work, and the coloring work Simon does on on Hershey. You know, we talked a lot about cinematography and approaching it in that kind of sense, and making the coloring sensitive to the mood of the piece. Um, and and then you'll have you know I don't know Henry Flint on the next story, or you'll have P.J. Holden on the next story, and and they're just totally totally different aesthetics, and we all just go fine. You know, because that's what 2000 has always been. So that's something I really enjoy about it. I think again, it's just that sense of creativity. I mean, you know, I've, it's you, you know, even when I was reading it when I was a kid, you had Brian Bolland on Dread one week, and you had Mick McMahon the next week. They're just from another world, both of them. But we just go, that's the that's the sort of tonal language of of, of this comic. I mean that that is a, an interesting question. What what is a two thousand AD story? Can can you actually define a two thousand AD story, even even in the broadest of terms? I, I, Alex, what's your thoughts? Gosh, um, I would be up first. Um, I mean, I think you know, it's it's almost always some sort of dystopian. Well, I mean, I guess. It's, uh, this, this is the wonderful thing about this question is, 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 is there even an answer? I keep thinking about the, I keep thinking about things and be like, no, but this other story is not quite like that. So, you know, like, um, 
It's, it's going to sound I mean, very flippant, but it's got a, it's got a little bit of that's got to be in there somewhere. I feel. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, there's there's definitely something that's a little bit punk rock about it at all times. A little um, bit. When when comics has increasingly not been that way. It's been you know comics comics especially in the U.S. has been very much moved towards a, a calculated IP farm for film and TV. Um, in, in, in the corporate sense, you know, of individual creators and their and their and their goals aside, um, and 2000 AD is just about having fun with the entire, you know, science fiction and fantasy toolbox. Um, I like that there's all, there's, you know, there aren't superheroes in 2000 AD because, you know, I feel that superheroes have. A reliance on superheroes has has created a, a a pop culture in the U.S. that's that's very into uh, militarization and vigilantes um, and and it's, it's not and 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 you know the shameless embrace of of, of capitalism um, and and wealth you know it, it's not I I, I like that. That's not a 2000 AD thing. I don't think it could ever be a 2000 AD thing. I don't think it could be a British culture thing in in, in, many, in many ways. Thank God. Um, you know, the and the variety is just of, of 2000 AD is just is part of the joy of it. You know, the fact that each of us are working on such different stories and they can all coexist in the same issue. Um, it was a bit of a, a trick question. Uh, <laughs> at the end of I the tried day. to answer it. I, <laughs> no, it absolutely. No, it's great. I mean, Alice, what, what's your thoughts on this? Because obviously, like I said, you know, we, we, we've got three writers here who, who are each doing very different things, but all under the same banner. Uh, do, do, you, do you think... And all for sort of the same reason, in a way. Like, we've exactly. all just been talking about, like, we're doing this for fun. And if you, if you do comics for long enough, you start only taking things and, and you're fortunate enough to be reasonably successful. You, you start only taking things that are enjoyable. Um, not because you should do them or, you know, it pays well or whatever. Um, it's always like, am I, am I going to have fun with this? Is this something I can play with? Is this something I can write something that I will enjoy? It's much, it's, it's, it's very little about what we think the audience will enjoy. I mean, for me, that almost never comes into it aside from, you know, making sure it's, coherent which is something I require as a reader as well I'm trying to please myself as a reader and trying to please myself as a creator and if you like it that's great and if you don't well at least I like it I mean Alish what's your, what's your thoughts on this yes uh, <laughs> no uh, no I'm uh, uh, um, thoughts it's great before 11 a.m. Uh, in California, thoughts. Um, let's go. Um, yeah, I think that... I don't think that 2080 fully even understands the scope of possibilities and stories that it actually has at its, at, at its disposal yet. I think that if you define a magazine as something that deals with futures, you have an, both an immense playing field and a responsibility in a way to really dig into what that means. And what that means um, from, you know, from multiple, multiple standpoints, what that means for a magazine working within, uh, you know, a post-colonial legacy, right, of the British government, etc. You have um, questions of what does fiction even look like in this century? Because I think that there are things, you know, I was just um, like, what are the ways in which we can talk about things like climate change, about immigration, about, you know, a million different factors. And nobody says that they have to be um, all serious by any means. I don't think there's ever been a single issue of 2000 AD that was entirely serious. Thanks, gods. Yeah, um, the most serious Judge Dredd story. Someone's always named a tower block something daft. I mean, it's part of just working on the Dredd story. Yeah. 
you know. And the thing is, and the, because the future is like that, right? The future is incredibly messy and complex. It will be simultaneously the funniest and the saddest thing that you've ever seen. And often they're happening at the same time and it's entirely overwhelming. And like that to me is the vibe that 2000 AD at its best really, really carries. And I feel can go even further and further with. And mm-hmm. that gets me excited. That is the thing that I think is unique and cool about it. And in some ways, you know, builds on um, things like, I forget what that magazine is like. It's on tip of my tongue, though, that Moorcock and Ballard were involved with in like 70s and 80s, you know, but there's like a lot of genuine tradition of, um, of speculative fiction that... I feel like we're on the start of not even a wave, but just like a redefinition of what it means to be creating something within the boundaries of something that I don't think sci-fi alone really contains fully. I think we've gotten to a moment where we are far too, we understand fiction way too much for the usual tricks to still work. So things need to get weirder and weirder. And I feel like 2008D's primary commitment maybe unspoken, but always kind of felt like this sense of like, oh, we want to get weirder, let's go weirder. Like when the going gets weird, the weird turn pro, that kind of thing. Yeah. I like yeah. that. I want that. Do, do, you, do you think the comic is evolving or just staying true to itself? I think uh, it can be both at the same time. Um, you know, I mean, the, the 2000 AD did take a very tactical, we're going to bring in a whole bunch of new blood and train them up and see which ones stick, you know, about five years ago. And I think that's when I came in. Um, mostly Arthur Wyatt dragged me in. Um, and um, uh, I did the, the, the dread books for the, for, the, for the film tie-in or some of them. Um, you know, I think that was a really good idea. Um, I think I think the All Ages is a great idea. Um, you know, some of it will stick, some of it won't. But that's that's always been 2000 AD. Like it, it throws a whole bunch of series against the wall. Some of them stick, some of them don't, and some you know some of them last on and on and keep you know and, and new creators take them up like like what Alice has done with 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 bringing Devlin to what it always should be. I mean, I always enjoyed Devlin Wall, but it always felt like it was like a little bit like softly, softly where it shouldn't be. And so Alice's Devlin is kind of like where I, where I have always wanted that story to go. Um, and, you know, the, 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 the young reader stuff is important. Um, you know, it might frustrate some of the older readers who are like, why is there this kid's thing that I have to deal with? Like, well, you know, cope. Um, but, you know, we need to bring, 2080 is one of the, you know, the few, comics still sold on newsstands and it's important to bring new readers into that to maintain comics as a whole um as well as the health of the magazine rob what, what's your thoughts because i mean like i said you know you, you've you've been yeah, with 2008 for a long yeah. time well i mean you, you you were you were one of the writers that matt smith bought in um not too long after he started his proper tenure as that I think Andy Diggle actually commissioned me. And then before my first thing was published, Andy left, which I mm-hmm. think I've said before may have been a reason he might have read what I wrote and thought it was time to go. Um, but um, oh, yeah, man. I think I've been here as long as Matt. So I think, it, I mean, I think it has evolved. I can't speak. The thing is, I think it's, it, that's a conversation for people in the building, such as yourself, Michael, and, and who would know what, what kind of think tank goes into it. It really, I think it's a healthy thing. It's always felt loose to me. Like, I've got a story. I'm pitching the story. Does does Matt Smith, you know, like it or not? Right? And, then, and then we go. If you, if you work for DC or Marvel, you know, there's there's writer's retreats. There's, oh, we're going to do a revamp. We're, we're, we're going this direction. We're going that direction. And people have to move along. It, it never feels like that, you know. And I think... Um, so I think there is, I think it is evolving. And the, the regen stuff is is certainly something sort of, you know, healthy and looking to try and get a new audience because it can't just be the old faithful because, you know, we're all gonna be dead soon. Um, but um that's cheery, isn't it? Uh but um no, I I I it still feels like it's a very um creatively healthy 
thing you know it, it comes down to what i said at the start of the you know the talk is just like if you've got a story you're interested in you pitch it and you go and, and, yeah. and um and i think as long as people are enthusiastic about what they're working on you know then then it has a ends up sometimes it, it pops and it has a life of its own like something like when i did the small house and you know with henry and i just seem to sort of hit a hit a bit of a sort of you know right place at right time and and so um yeah i mean i think for people in the building they would have to sort of go we need to we need to keep this appealing to to a new audience basically constantly but i think you know if, as long as you tell good stories you'll do that yeah i like the i really like the lack of corporate direction you know beyond like you know, I mean, the, even the Regine stuff was just Matt calling me up and going, hey, Alex, we're doing this all ages issue. You wouldn't happen to have an all ages pitch lying around, would you? And I went, oh, yes, I do. Um, and that was that was how it started. So, you know, it's I think the one thing he told me was uh, I had some bears being shot and the bears couldn't be shot. So we made them robot bears because you can shoot robot bears but you, and then cut them up. But you can't cut up flesh and blood bears. So we have bear bots. <laughs> Letter, not spirit. Oh, <laughs> as uh, as writers, when looking at something like uh, you know, looking can start a new story for two thousand AD. What's the what's the first step for each of you? You know, is is it is it the idea? Is it the character? Is it just a, you know, does a scene pop into your head? You're like, well, I want to build a story around that. You know, what 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 are the kind of touchstones that um, that you try to find when when writing a, a two thousand AD series? Was well, is that with you, Rob? Do you know what I, I was thinking about? I genuinely don't know. It's different all the time. There's not there's not one trick. You don't go. Oh, I need to generate a new story. I will I will go to my generation process. It's just something will noodle away, and you know, it's it's. It, I think it's that for me. The I I, I one thing I really never enjoyed was when an editor would get in touch and go have you oh would, would you like to pitch for this and you go absolutely i'd love to pitch for this and then you just stare at a wall for two days you know i i kind of because i'm older and and bolder um it i i much prefer the fact you know i'll have a couple of ideas and it'll noodle away for a while and then it might take a, a you know i'll write something down in my notebook and it's not quite there and something else then will kick it and I'll go, oh, okay, I, I, I know what to do with that now, you know? But it's not um, that kind of in, inception of stories is, I've been doing this for 20 years and it's a mystery to me still. And they all come out in different ways. You know, there's, there's no hard and fast rule to it. You know what I mean? It's, um, uh, and uh, you know, and then I think then you bring in things like structure and then you can go, I know what I, I, I can build it now. I, I know what I need to do to build it, to make it work, uh, to, to make a good story. But coming up with sort of the DNA of it in the first place is, um, I don't know. No yeah, it's alchemy. Like it's, it happens in so many different ways. I mean, I, I, I don't, I just come up with stories and I eventually find someone willing to publish them. Um, so it's not like I'm going to think up a 2000 AD pitch. It's I'm, I'm poking at this weird psychic wound I have mm. or this feeling or this emotion or this scene or something and trying to make it grow in, in, in the notebook, we notebook and it's in my horrible, horrible chicken scratch, which nobody can read. Yeah. Uh, uh, I have, right I have you. Of, yeah. Hey, um, and um, eventually, you know, it either becomes something or it doesn't like, you know, you gradually get enough momentum where you know the characters, you know, really what you're trying to explore. You know, you know, if, the, if there's going to be an ending, I mean, the thing I'm working on right now is like, a, which actually might be a 2000 AD story, to be fair, um, which work quite well for 2000 AD. Um, is like a serialized portraiture kind of thing, like a bit like Naoki or Sawa's monster, where like you've got two connecting characters that take you through all these situations over time. Um, it's a you know, essentially a horror story, but it, it's horror in the ways of something like uh, Chainsaw Man, where where because I love I love the treatment of the devils in Chainsaw Man. So it's this, it's this great gestalt process of taking feelings and ideas and characters and influences and and making something new. I mean, there you know, there's there's no story is fully new. Every story is is a continuation or a variation on some something else, in a way. Um, uh, Sometimes the stories come very fast. I mean, I, I was exhausted driving to Maine from New York uh, over the summer. Um, it's a, about an eight hour drive. And I completely thought up my next graphic novel with Erica Henderson 
during the drive, sat down, started notes on it. Whole book was finished by um, by mid October, and you know it's 111 page ish, 114 page graphic novel. She's drawing it now. You know, did I really expect to have that book exist? No, I didn't. But like my brain was on pause while I was on the freeway for a very long time, and and out it came because I was having feelings about the thing. Um, others have taken years. Mm. Alish, what about you? Do, do you have kind of, there's a, isn't there a German word for shower thoughts, which is exactly what you just described, Alex, where basically your, your, your brain is off and all of a sudden it kind of pops in. Is, oh, I choose these activities. Like I choose running. I choose just going, yeah. you know, going to movie theaters, like continually putting myself in liminal spaces where my brain is having to do something that's like not super challenging. So I can like, then, then the hard work of like turning over stories happens. Yeah. I, I would absolutely back that up. If you go for a run, go for it, have a shower, have a bath, think about something else. And very often it'll just pop in and you kind of go, Oh, that, that's why it doesn't work. That's why that, that's what was holding it all up. But if you actually just stare at your screen for ages, Going, uh, you'll just freeze very often. Or going to the pub and tell and tell and telling your friends the story problem, that, and you're like, "Help me solve this." And by the time you finish telling them that, you realize you've got the answer already, and they're just like, "Yeah, buy us buy us pints now." Oh, I did, I did one thing once. I, I thought it was good with this. With Chris, I was stuck on with something with Judge Dredd control, and mm. I don't know how to end it. I, I don't know how to get him out of it. And I rang up Chris Weston, and I went, "Chris, I'm stuck." And Chris went, "Well, what about?" And I went, "Got it. Thanks." And it was just all I needed to do was, it turns out, was speak to another human being for two seconds. And it was like, oh, it just popped in. And Chris is like, oh, okay, thanks. <laughs> so, there, yeah, no hard and fast rules. I, I can sign all that in terms of, you know, I think you just learn what works for you when it comes to when your brain needs to be set in a specific place and you need something that's as far away from the thing itself as possible versus when deeper immersion and things that are sort of like, you know, maybe thematically cohesive towards a certain spot kind of, you know, there's different ways of putting yourself into trance. There's different ways of putting yourself into a zone. Sometimes the zone is honestly the last thing you need. And it's kind of, I think the, the job of I think any sort of a creative any sort of an artist is figuring out which works when and I think it also can change project for project with like with Devil Info I'm super structured I I have two big screens um, you know I wake up I pop an edible I inject my coffee I turn on gate porn and boxing and have them running in the background the stories just come um but no really that that's not actually my process um to be fair don't uh, please like don't try this at home no do but like don't expect the right um it's like a really good saturday morning to be honest it's this is, so yeah it's it, it could work um uh, but no it's it's mostly just making sure that i sit behind the table and that i show up and even on the days when the writing might not be good, um, putting something down just helps because it gives you a different place to start from the next day instead of staring at the exact same page as you did the day before. Even if 99% of it is completely unusable, it might be worth enough that it unlocks a piece somewhere. Um, and other times as little, it just um, everything that you two just described or doing something as simple as just switching projects, just yeah. going to another thing. And maybe it's a thematically similar thing. Maybe it's a completely different thing, but again, it's kind of like playing, um, it's kind of like playing Scrabble with your own brain a little bit, or like uh, some weird Tetris where, you know, you uh, might not necessarily have the right piece for this, but you have another piece that fits and you raise a line and suddenly voila, you know, space is open. Um, it's messy. It's um, completely incomprehensible, even to me. I don't think I'll ever fully understand it, but I'm all right with that. It's kind of a part of the fun of the job, honestly, is the fact that the mystery just stays. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, uh, with, with, with coming to the to, to the end of our, our conversation, and um, I want to loop back around to something that we talked about in the first 10 minutes, which is about freedom and having the freedom to tell the stories that, that, that you want to tell. Um, gloves off, absolute 
any story you want to tell in, two, in the pages of 2000 AD, what story do you tell? Gosh. You have to pay us for that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, let me let me let me get my agent on the phone right now. We can, we can start. Well, I think you can, right? I mean, I think I, I don't know. I mean, you, none of us are going to come up with stories now. I mean, whatever themes interest you, you put into the work. But I mean, just the fact that you say that Alice is doing talking dildos and. You know, and, and we've got a conversation here, like you said, with sort of an all ages book and then talking dildos and then dread and his despotic sort of fascism and sort of telling all these stories of humanity in Mega City One when it's under the boot of a totalitarian regime. And, you know, you, you I mean, that's one of the, I mean, just in Dread's world alone, you can tell any story, you know, and just yeah. absolutely. And, and so that's definitely true, more so of within the pages of, of a comic. Um, I mean, dread is dread is exactly what I mean in terms of an exercise in serial portraiture, and, and, and you know, it's the, the stories are obviously about dread, and dread does have an arc in them, but it's much more, you know, but equal importance in every dread story is, is is you know whoever he's investigating, whatever you know whoever he's alongside. That it's the it's the side characters in some ways that really make dread. Yeah, um, yeah I, I I'm not sure I hundred percent. I know what you mean, but I'm not sure I hundred. Yeah. One of the things I've always enjoyed about trying to write dread is trying to write dread the the, the, the human being underneath and and you know which is which is difficult but also challenging but that, that's what makes it interesting i mean i, I took my gloves off mike i would say i don't think anyone's ever done race in in dread's world i'm not sure i've got the i'm the, the, get, the guts to do it um i mean there's the, there's the mooty rights thing of course but that's the most that's the most unlikely thing about dread's world is the fact that no one ever for all the problems it has, no one ever talks really about sort of um, about race. Um, so maybe someone needs to have a go at that at some point. That's I mean, a classic I, '60s and '70s sci-fi thing of like, you know, yeah. we're going to have totalitarianism and mm. and so oppressed people, but, we're not at, but in this in this this society of the of the oppressed, magically we no longer have racial or or gender issues. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Religious issues, you know. Mm. Um, and you know the class, the classic '70s alpha male sci-fi of like you know uh, about like you know, the white people are enslaved now. <laughs> like, mm. really, <laughs> what you doing there? <laughs> I mean, that, that, yeah. that's a, that's a long-standing issue with sci-fi that it, it it so often it deals with problems in the abstract or in the metaphorical, or you know, but doesn't necessarily in doing so doesn't necessarily actually deal with those issues. Mm. Because it expects the audience to understand what it's trying to say in the first place, or or the people experiencing those issues aren't part of the writers' room, which is usually the exactly. case. Well, I, I think that's so, an important. So we have like, so yeah. we have nudie rights, and we have oh yes, well we definitely have POC because we have alien characters, and you're just like, okay. Well, I mean, I think that's that's something to be said for you know more diversity in the writing of of of, of Dread's World is is probably a, a healthy thing. Basically, yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, I mean, I wrote closet about gay, one story about gay culture in Mega City One and uh, you know I think you know in 40 odd years there should probably be more <laughs> you yeah. know but yeah more diversity in, in, in the voices right you know right in to deal with a number of different subjects would be really interesting. Yeah I mean big code sign on that pretty much more than anything else if you know if um if I was to pick something and it wouldn't be, let's say, you know, like doing just a, you know, an OGN or something set in like Dread's World or, you know, Slain or something like that. Um, I think what's more and more important than that is genuinely just actually opening up the space more and more. Like, you know, like let's let's like let's own it. Even on this panel, you know, like I didn't realize it, but like we're all white here. Like we shouldn't really have to be running panels, all white panels in comics in 2022. Um, it still happens, you know. Okay, but at the end of the day, if we're talking about a future, if we're inventing new futures, there's so much space. There's so much opportunity. I want to see 
I want to see like a graphic novel by somebody who goes, oh, you know what? Let's go back and let's talk about why Mega City One was the way it is for 40 years now and everybody else is writing. But let's talk about it through talking about the story behind the story, right? Um, and also, frankly, just hiring hiring writers and hiring artists um, who don't have to do stories about race just because they are different, just because they are diverse. Like that's that to me is where you genuinely start actually seeing the change. The moment you're not hiring for representation, but the moment you're hiring uh, not for representation in stories, but simply yeah. because that is the process and that is a part of the process that becomes integral. And I think that comes over time. And it comes with us having those conversations and then taking them and kind of like letting that resonate further and further. I mean, one of the wonderful things about, I, I found joining joining 2080 was immediately, it was like, oh, you want, oh, you've done some stuff. You want to write Dread? And I was like, all right. And the way that goes in America, usually as a female writer is like, oh, would you do this C-list female superhero miniseries? And we'll test you out and see if you're all right. And you never get to write Batman anyway, or Superman or Iron Man, because, you, you, you know, they have white men for that. Um, or, you know, or maybe a black writer, as long as they've won like the Nobel Prize or something like that. Heaven forbid it be a black comics writer. Um, so, you know, it was just the sea change for me where no one ever said, oh, but don't you want to write women's stories? I'm like, no, no, like sometimes, yes, but like if you hire me to write women's stories, I'm going to be quite peeved at you because I just want the same choices that like, you know, Rob and Alice get. That's, that's yeah. the thing. I think that's anytime you're hiring a diverse writer or, and, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I don't count as diverse. I'm a, you know, white woman, I've got all the privilege I can handle. Um, you know, you, 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 you just, it's easy. You just give them the same choices you're giving your white male writers. You don't hire them to write the black history month story. You hire them to write any story they feel like. But then you get more diversity of, of, of voices. And it, like you say, it comes through viral yeah. osmosis, right? You just get a healthier worldview because you get more, well, a wider it, it array of people your actual world. <laughs> given the same choices so that you guys get, they get the same opportunity that we've all had, which is write something. Because we've all been talking about we're writing stories we really enjoy. We pick stories we like and we write them and we have fun with it. And that's how and that's how you get the best out of every writer rather than, you know, in putting them in to fulfill a quota and saying, well, we need, you know, more brown faces. So we'll hire this brown writer and we'll make them write, a, you know, make them write a race conscious story because we feel we need to have that. It's just you, you hire a, you hire a black writer and you say, write whatever you want. You know, if you want to write dread, write dread, you know. If you want to write Rogue Trooper, wrote, write, you know, or, or anything like that, like write, run, write your own series, fine, do that, you know, pitch it. Um, so yeah, it's just about equality of choice rather than just ghettoizing creators, diverse creators into small niches where they theoretically have to test out because they're less experienced. Um, unfortunately, we we have run out of time. Um, I feel like this conversation could could run um but uh we've we've, we've fulfilled an, a, 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 an hour but i just want to say thank you so much to the three of you this this has been an absolutely fascinating conversation i feel like we've touched on so many things um and really got down into the the meat of it um you know the 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 the, the uh the range of stories that could be told at 2000 ad and and just uh yeah how the magic happens so thank you to you all for uh for chatting away it's been a pleasure Here's to more magic. Yeah. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you for coming. Yeah, cheers, guys. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much indeed. Take care, guys.